Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martha Whitehead, and I am president, vice president for the Harvard Library and University Librarian. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to 20 years and counting a digital preservation conversation. With this celebration, we want to mark 20 years of digital preservation at Harvard Library. I was really delighted to see the range of people that we attracted to this event, around 300 interested individuals from peer institutions across the country and some from around the world, as well as friends of Harvard and current and former colleagues. I'm particularly pleased that our participants include so many people who've had a role in advancing digital preservation at Harvard. And I really hope we do justice to your efforts in today's event. So as one of the most comprehensive research libraries in the world, we feel a strong sense of responsibility for advancing open knowledge. And a significant element of that is stewardship of collections for future use. And we approach this holistically, applying best practice methods and treatments to a broad range of materials from physical objects to digital files. And our toolbox to do this work is wide and deep from paste brushes to x-rays and advanced algorithms for audio preservation work. And we are really fortunate to have some of the best experts in conservation and preservation of materials in all formats on our staff. And of course, the same strategic mission and aspirations apply to both preservation of physical objects and digital files. What is different are the tools and the tactical approach. For physical objects, storage in an appropriate environmental condition is often the most appropriate preservation strategy. For digital materials, the lack of continual proactive attention is potentially disastrous. So digital preservation combines policies, strategies, and actions that ensure access to digital content over time. Harvard Library has had a really robust digital repository service in place since 2000, providing secure monitored storage and preservation services for millions of files in many different digital formats, as you saw in the slideshow. We're in the process of assessing how to update and scale this service to meet growing and more complex digital preservation needs in collaboration with colleagues at other institutions. This will be a key element for our contributions to ensuring that information is not only openly accessible and usable today, but far into the future. So let me now introduce our panelists for today's event. They will be discussing history, future, and challenges that lie ahead. We're very pleased to have with us Abby Smith Rumsey, who is a writer and historian focusing on the creation, preservation, and use of the cultural record in all media. Abby has served as director of the Scholarly Communication Institute at the University of Virginia and has advised universities and their research libraries on strategies to integrate digital information resources into existing collections and services. For over a decade, she worked on the Library of Congress's National Digital Information Infrastructure and Preservation Program in development of a national strategy to identify, collect, and preserve digital content of long-term value. Abby served on the National Science Foundation's Blue Ribbon Task Force on Sustainable Digital Preservation and Access, as well as the ACLS Commission on Cyber Infrastructure for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Stephen Abrams is the head of digital preservation at Harvard Library, developing, leading, and administering programs and services that meet and anticipate the digital preservation needs of the Harvard community. Prior to joining Harvard in 2018, Stephen was the associate director of the University of California Creation Center at the California Digital Library. As associate director, he had responsibility for strategic planning, innovation, and oversight of the center's systems, services, and initiatives. And we have Stuart Snydman, who's Associate University Librarian and Managing Director for Library Technology Services at Harvard. LTS plans and develops the library technology portfolio and maintains reliable enterprise library applications to facilitate search, discovery, and access to knowledge. Before coming to Harvard in July of 2019, just a month after me, Stu spent 17 years helping to build Stanford's digitization and digital library access program. In his subsequent role as Associate Director for Digital Strategy, Stu oversaw the development of online services enabling discovery and access to library resources. So we will start our program with Stu. Over to you, Stu. Thank you, Martha, and hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here and grateful to be able to celebrate this important milestone. 
uh, for both Harvard and for the history of digital preservation. The original proposal for the Library Digital Initiative, which is a five-year, $12 million program funded by Harvard and funded the DRS, was approved in 1998. The functional requirements for the DRS were completed in 1999. That same year, I was still a graduate student at Stanford, working on an early digitization project to scan the archives of the general agreements on tariffs and trade. Stanford, like many of its peers, was investing a considerable amount of time, energy, and resources, producing digital copies of library materials with the promise of enhancing research and teaching in the emerging and increasingly globalized digital world. One thing led to another, and within a few years, I was working full-time for the Stanford Library in their nascent digital library program. And we quickly turned our attention to the thorny issues of how to store the data we were producing and how to actually get it online and to users. I was in the earliest stages of my career in library technology and digital preservation was very much a topic, but it felt mostly theoretical to me at the time. I do recall, however, quite clearly watching with great interest as Harvard and a very few other institutions were taking bold and pioneering steps to implement real systems for dealing with these issues at scale. It's important to note that Harvard naming the program Library Digital Initiative was not an accident, but rather very intentional, and it foretold the deep integration of technology into the fabric of the library. Dale Flecker, the visionary leader and architect of the initiative, wanted to position digital as, quote, just part of being a research library. And in fact, now we of course see that technology touches every part of the modern library. Dale and his colleagues pursued an ambitious goal to build a production system for a set of functions and requirements that were not supported by any packaged commercial technologies at the time. The Library Digital Initiative was expansive, but at, at its core was, as Dale wrote in his year 2000 DLive Magazine article, a general repository. Its purpose is to provide a robust service to store, manage, protect, and serve heterogeneous digital objects, and to provide information and facilities for the preservation of those objects, written in the year 2000. As you listen to that quote, that description, you realize how foundational the concept of the digital repository has become to the modern research library. In fact, all memory institutions. Back then, this was relatively novel, and there were few of any production systems in academic research libraries that operated at scale until the Harvard team set about its work. And they built the system to last, which it's done for more than 20, for, for, it's for 20 years. It served Harvard through reliable preservation of its unmatched digital collections and has evolved over time with the emergence of new file formats, user requirements, and technologies. But in reality, the credit doesn't go to the system, but rather to the people, the scores of talented technologists working hand in hand with library and archives professionals who have made a major imprint on the field of digital preservation as they built and grew the Harvard DRS. We can make direct connections between the contributions of the Harvard DRS teams of the past 20 years to pioneering technologies and standards such as early web and email archiving systems, Jove, a uh, format validation tool that is ubiquitous in the digital preservation toolkit, the archival standard for PDF, PDFA, the Audio Engineering Society's audio preservation standard, the National Library of Medicine's e-journal schema, the early Google book scanning specification, and contributions to preservation metadata standards like METS and PREMIS. So for Harvard, it's unimaginable to think of one of the great libraries in the world without a robust and durable digital preservation system. As both system and service, the DRS is the manifestation of Harvard University's trust in the Harvard Library for preserving its most precious assets. Not only its unmatched collections built over its nearly 400 year history, but also the intellectual output of the institution in the form of scholarly publications, electronic theses and dissertations, research data sets produced by Harvard faculty and students. It's also hard to imagine the field of digital preservation, so critical now that we live in a world where the entire cultural record is digital without the contributions of Harvard and its pioneering peers. So I, for one, am looking forward to the next 20 years of DRS, having just arrived, um, well, 20 years, give or take, uh, and the chance to work with the current generation of extremely talented technologists, library and archives professionals to continue this important work. So looking forward to the conversation and happy birthday, DRS. 
Oh, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, one of those talented professionals that came here in 1999 uh, with the Library Digital Initiative, Stephen Abrams. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Stu. Uh, and thanks to all of you who um, are listening in to learn a little bit more about what we've been doing over these past two decades. Uh, so I want to address the question of what exactly is the DRS, the Digital Repository Service? Um, this question can be answered from a variety of perspectives. Uh, most immediately, the DRS is a system, or rather a set of interlocking systems um, with a variety of software and hardware components uh, for the long-term management of the university's valuable digital content. Importantly, it is an ever-evolving system. Uh, for example, we replace the underlying hardware every five years. And in fact, we're, we're in a fifth year year right now. Um, so planning is underway for replacement of our disk and tape storage systems. The software side of things, um, on the other hand, undergoes continual rather than intermittent maintenance and enhancement to ensure its ongoing reliability and function. From a broader conceptual point of view, however, the DRS is, uh, and I quote, a set of services and related facilities, end quote, as it was described in the earliest design document dating back to December, 1998. These services, uh, as Stu just alluded to, um, encompass a variety of critical preservation functions uh, for things such as accessioning, identifying, describing, verifying, storing, manipulating, and uh, vitally importantly, uh, retrieving digital content. While the system is essentially an ephemeral thing, continually being reimagined and revitalized to keep pace with technological evolution, the set of supported abstract services underlying it um, persist over time uh, and in fact are periodically augmented with new service functions reflecting new stakeholder needs, goals, and aspirations. Uh, the DRS, of course, is a central technical component of the library's digital preservation program. Uh, and as such, it is complemented by a suite of non-technical services, um, human-delivered services, for things such as outreach, training, consultation, uh, best practice guidance, and advocacy. Both these human and technical facets are necessary for effectively addressing our programmatic imperatives. Uh, those imperatives were articulated in um, our recent restatement of the library's digital preservation policy, uh, and they are twofold. First is to ensure the persistence of authentic information objects, the actual digital content itself. Uh, it, but to this is wedded a second um, go a goal, which isn't always explicitly uh, recognized or accepted even within the preservation community. And that is to provide assurance of the persistence of legitimate information experiences, making use of those objects. This latter is vitally important because digital preservation or any preservation isn't a goal in its own right. It is only the means towards the final proper goal of facilitating human communication across time. Now that overarching programmatic goal is really nothing more or less than a manifestation of the longstanding mission of the Harvard Library, or indeed any library, to acquire, to hold, and to make available. While that mission tends to be um, expressed uh, independent of medium or genre or modality, in the 21st century context, it certainly must encompass the bewildering variety of digital artifacts that are so indispensable to all aspects of contemporary life. And luckily for Harvard, for the last 20 years, uh, the DRS and the library's digital preservation initiatives have been in the forefront of that activity. Uh, with that, I will now like to turn things over to uh, Abby, um, who will be able to situate um, a number of these uh, initiatives um, in, um, in a historical context for us. Abby? Thanks, Steve. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations to you all. 20 years is an extraordinary run for Harvard and for digital preservation. It's astonishing to me that, in fact, I was um, billed as a digital preservation historian for this event. It's astonishing that there is such a thing as digital preservation history right now. Um, and 20 years is, I don't know, it really feels 
like it could not be not just two decades, but two centuries in internet time. So I wanna start by taking us back to 2020, uh, sorry, 20, 2000, when um, Dale first published the article iterating what the DLI is going to be. Um, you know, we owe a great deal to that vision. Uh, it's not just Dale and all the people who supported him, but I also wanna call out Sid Verba in particular, Martha's predecessor, who really supported this vision when it seemed um, not just visionary, but also extreme and also expensive. Um, it, was a, it's a, it was a conviction that Harvard needed to lead in all things, especially about um, digital preservation and in fact, all library issues. And I think this is an issue that I'll return to in a few minutes. Um, one of the things that's interesting about digital preservation in the beginning was we had no paradigms for thinking about preservation except as um, preserving fixed physical objects. And I think for the first, for first two decades, in fact, preservation specialists have been struggling with how to reimagine preserving something which is essentially dynamic. And, and as Stephen said, something which is always changing and which is an experience. So that's one of the challenges that we address, that we need to address in the future. I wanna go back to Dale's original vision in which he says um, the first goal that he set out for DLI was, and I quote him, to make Harvard's growing digital collections coherent and easy to use through the development of a common framework and infrastructure through communication and coordination and through the use of incentives for collaborative work. I'm not sure that I can add anything, any of us would add anything to that because those I understand are still the challenges and the commitments that Harvard's making in looking at itself now and reinventing its uh, preservation efforts for the next 20 years. So I wanna talk about three things briefly um, that I wanna speak about as, if I can put it like this, um, as an historian speaking from the future. So I'll put myself as an historian in the future, which is for my profession, extremely gauche to think about that. But I wanna think backwards from that moment to what historians will be expecting in 50 years. Um, the first is about collections. The second is about leadership. And the third is about users. So I wanna say that um, collections in the first couple of years, the first two decades, digital collecting, and this is for born digital material, has been very event focused. And I think that's a good thing in many ways. Um, and it's a natural thing for digital historians to have focused on, particularly web-based um, collectors, because events are salient. They're well covered in the digital space. Uh, they always are newsworthy or they attract attention. And they have the appearance of being bounded. And so they had this connection with an analog object which was bounded and fixed in time, whether it was hurricanes or elections or the Pope's elevation, whatever it was, it seemed like there was a beginning and a middle and an end. But in fact, as we know from looking at COVID, which seems like a mega event, that the beginning is quite obscure. I mean, it would probably start it, well, we will constantly amend when it was that we first detected the Wuhan virus. Um, in the United States and other places. And it also harkens back to 1918 and times before that. So events can be deceptive in their fixedness. Um, I think in the long term or in the short term um, that we need to be thinking more about how to actually uh, preserve things which are continuous, which allow for longitudinal analysis in the future, the things that capture the flow of time and can be data mineable in, that, in the way that um, things, time-based media and data sets can be over the long term. I think there's a lot to learn from the audiovisual community about how to sample significantly in a way that makes sense in the future. That's one thing I would point to. And in there, I think there's a gap that could be fixed, sorry, could be filled um, by Harvard and other research libraries which is the loss of local news coverage, which is lamentable and very important for our democratic government and populace to heal and to start connecting with one another again. Um, and I think that libraries like Harvard can partner with local news sources online to start ensuring that some of their files and some of their, um, their formats are preserved. So that's, um, 
that's about collections, but it also leads me into leadership. And that is the role I recommend for Harvard to reclaim its leadership in the next 20 years as a leading partner in digital preservation for organizations, institutions, and other or types of organizations in collecting their own content and serving their own communities. I think there are very important partnerships that Harvard, each of its schools and its library, of course, could could reach out to its natural constituents outside of the library and outside of the campus to help them document to their own community, which is something that Schlesinger has led with um, quite admirably and very successful in. And I think that they can point the way to how to do this digitally as well. I would say that in terms of professional development and thinking about the digital that in many ways, Harvard has much more to learn from the communities that they will partner with than, than the, those communities have to learn from the technical expertise from Harvard. Because we're really dealing with extra institutional communities that have different epistemologies. We understand this from digital, sorry, from um, indigenous communities and even African-American communities that are documenting themselves now that have a very different tradition of organizing and representing information and validating the authenticity of that, which is something which will be critical, I think, for Harvard and other research libraries to learn in the future. And finally, I will say that um, we should never underestimate the intelligence of future users. Um, I will argue very strenuously that it is better to collect something than nothing because we don't know how to deal with the something right now. Um, I know this might be a technical challenge. I always believe that bits are bits and perhaps I'm being ignorant here, but I do really believe that as things keep evolving, that also means that the users will too. They will grow increasingly sophisticated and they really would rather have something that they could use, that they would, could devise some kind of technical solution to bringing together and creating coherence and having nothing to work with at all. I say this as um, humbly as a medievalist. Um, who dealt with a lot of absences of documentation, but still managed to work with things that existed. After all, who would have ever guessed that DNA analysis would help us understand vellum manuscripts? That was inconceivable 40, 50 years ago. So I would say that in thinking about the original vision that Dale had about coherence and ease of use, remember always that coherence happens in the future at the moment, uh, at the point of access. Not now, but in fact, when it is accessed in the future. And so does ease of use. And those are problems that we can very safely and I think responsibly pass on to the next generation of technical experts and users and faculty and collectors, because it is always better to have something than nothing. And that was the lesson, the most important lesson from the Blue Ribbon Task Force of the, of that, um, that was convened by NSF. Um, that it is better to just collect than to cogitate and make no decision at all. And so with those um, exhortations for the future, I turn it back to Martha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby, and thank you all. You've uh, just done a fabulous job of setting us up for an excellent conversation, I think. And I invite um, all of our speakers to unmute and turn on your video and we'll have a good conversation following up on your great opening remarks. So we have a number of questions and we would invite uh, people who'd like to ask questions. We'll have some time at the end, we hope to take questions from the audience and thank you to those who sent us questions in advance. They were useful for thinking about the conversation that we wanted to have. So, so my first question for the panelists is, what are the lessons learned over the past 20 years? You know, what worked well, um, what didn't work as anticipated? Whoever would like to jump in, please do. Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll get us give us a start. Um, of course, I don't have the perspective uh, uh, of the Harvard perspective, uh, aside from my sixteen or seventeen months here. But as Martha mentioned, I've been kind of observing and watching and participating in the digital preservation activities for for a while. And I'll mention a few things. I think the first and I'll probably mention this multiple times, and Abby mentioned partnerships, is collaboration um, in a, a something that worked, that works. Um, I think there has been a realization that digital preservation is a shared concern, um, and the challenge is, is too big for any of us to face alone. 
And that's evidenced by even back in the year 1999, 2000, 2001, there was a small cohort of institutions that were working on this and they were communicating. Um, the library community, and in particular, the digital preservation and library technology communities, um, they're great at sharing knowledge. And there've been real successes in co-development of community-based open source um, and just information sharing across institutions. So I think that's something that's worked really well. Maybe something that hasn't worked quite as well, um, and there, there are examples of successes here, are actual consortial preservation repositories. That's a little bit trickier, um, I think, because institutional concerns and local concerns can often make it make it challenging to kind of pool your uh, your, your preservation activities together. Although it, it's it's something that um, I think we need to kind of work harder at in the future. Uh, uh, another thing is that our early digital preservation systems uh, were often homegrown and somewhat monolithic, meaning there were systems that were built to try to kind of do it all. Um, the preservation activity and the, the access activity and everything in between. Um, and this is the way systems have been, were built uh, uh, 20 years ago. Um, I think we've learned great lessons at Harvard and others um, uh, that, that the most effective IT systems, especially for tackling problems that are this big and that are this ever changing are more modular and loosely coupled and based on, based on uh, standards. Um, and I, I wanna talk about the third thing very quickly is standards. Um, something else that I think uh, has worked well over the years. They're hard to develop, but standards and especially open standards, um, that is those that are open and free to use um, and collaborative to create are critical. Standards like METS and PREMIS and others um, make it easier to build tools and systems that do the same thing, do the same thing um, and do it as specified. It, and it also encourages interoperability. So I think, I think my first thoughts are that um, you know, collaboration, um, modular systems and leveraging open standards are a couple of things that we've learned over the years that work really well. Well, uh, sorry, Stephen, I'll, I'll just say a few things. First is I think one thing that it, it may not have been a mistake um, because it's hard to um, know um, what a mistake would look like um, when we were just learning. But I think there was um, that, we, that we should not repeat focusing on very bespoke things for faculty and students. Um, I understand that that was something that was necessary even to get, um, shall we say, some of the humanities faculty um, have confidence in digital creation and present, presentation. But I think that going forward, that preservation, sorry, that digital is always gonna be the default mode of creation. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that I would recommend that to the extent that it is possible with the faculty that you have um, to be more assertive about what formats you can preserve and what you cannot and be directive about and clear about what they create because it is a research tool for their own work and something that they themselves need to think about as a commitment to the long-term of the scholarly record. Um, I know that is a difficult message to get across sometimes, but I think if you are frank about the risk of failure in preservation of highly articulated and specialized things, that it might, um, and, and the responsibilities that faculty and students have for becoming their own first line curators and preservation um, archivists, I think that will help in the long run to build a much more robust future collection. Um, well, um, I was actually lucky enough to have been here uh, at Harvard and for my first stint 20 years ago. Um, so I was sort of present at the creation. Uh, as has been alluded to a couple of times already, uh, back then there were no models. Uh, there was nothing we could buy. There was nothing we could copy. Uh, if we wanted to do something, uh, we had to build it ourselves, uh, which we did. Um, now that that's particularly exhilarating uh, from a technolo te technologist point of view, um, especially when it works, which, which I think it has, it has worked superbly well. Um, but when various sorts of external uh, community supported and commercial products and solutions began to appear, uh, we never quite thought that they were as good as we had already become. And we never thought they were quite up to dealing with the kind of scale to which we had already grown. Uh, and it never seemed quite worthwhile for us to contemplate moving 
and tr transitioning away from uh, a homegrown system to, to something that had been vended. Uh, now, however, I think it's fair to say we're all recognizing that we've probably kept with a homegrown system a bit too long. It's, it is a bit long of a tooth, uh, which is not to say that it has not been continually up, upgraded and, and evolved over time as necessary. Uh, but there are still, there are some design assumptions that are built in that, that were there right from the beginning. Um, and beyond that, it is just, it's extraordinarily expensive and, and it puts a, a tremendous amount of pressure on Stu's amazing staff uh, to, to do that kind of thing. Um, so luckily, um, there are lots of uh, very plausible alternatives uh, available to us. And we have in fact started up a, what will no doubt be a very long multi-year project to figure out what the long range roadmap um, and, uh, and development plan and deployment plan for some future iteration of the DRS as a service will be. You know, the system is certainly going to change. Uh, the service is going to, is, is going to remain uh, and, and the type of service assurances uh, that we have are going to remain. So I would say that you know, we, none of that is really a failure or a mistake or a problem. Uh, we went into this as an experiment uh, and it's turned out to be an extraordinarily a successful and fruitful one. Um, and uh, we have in fact been been able to uh, learn, I think the proper lessons from it. Yeah, and I'll say this is one of the reasons why it's very exciting to be leading Harvard Library at this time, just thinking we are at this moment, this inflection of really needing to, to change directions. And uh, we have a lot of great stuff to build on and a lot of great things to do ahead. So I wanted to switch things a little bit, and you've mentioned this to some extent, but what are the changes in the outside landscape that are being imposed on us? And how is that, how is that driving the direction for digital preservation for us? Well, I, I will say, um, and I'm gonna leave the, um, the technical aspects of this to my colleagues, um, but I, I'll say one of the things that's been remarkable is the change in use. Um, so, and I'm talking specifically about the devices people use um, to access this information. I mean, it is really inconceivable uh, 20 years ago that we would all be having smartphones and that would be the default mode of looking for almost everything. Um, so, you know, I think this is a challenge for, um, for presenting information from the archives um, and also trying to provide some kind of context. And this is a curatorial question really, but providing some kind of context for the way that people use things. Um, I also think it's, um, it's really a challenge to figure out how to deal with social media um, and how to represent not necessarily the content of it, but the dynamic of it which has been so significant. I mean, it's, I think it's not enough to just um, to record everything or to save salient comments about what it's done, but actually to preserve some sample of the experience of social media and the, um, all the psychological effects that may or may not be attributable to the use of social media, but the general um, angst around it, I think is also important um, to document along with you know the experience of it which will be difficult a eh, steven <laughs> yes yes um so i actually have a, a couple of points i, I want to bring up um all too quickly so i'll apologize in advance uh first off i think one of the challenges that we face is the sort of ongoing uh, arms race <laughs> that has always existed between the ever increasing innovation in uh, in terms of new content genres new formats new modes of interaction uh, with our ability uh, to capture, to understand, and to formulate um, effective means for, for preserving those things. Uh, the very nature and the, and the way in which information is presented to us uh, has just has completely changed. 20 years ago, we were basically, we were dealing with sort of files. Things were documents. They were, they were photographic images and so forth. And that's, that's relatively straightforward. I think over time, we've, we've evolved a, a body of, of technique to be able to deal with those um, uh, really quite well. Um, but of course, as we're all aware nowadays, uh, information comes to us in a very, very different way. Uh, information is performed for us. You know, it, it, is, it is highly dynamic. It is immersive uh, mm -hmm. in, in all sorts of complicated ways. 
Um, and so the, the very nature of the preservable thing has, has just completely, completely flopped over from this sort of static final form thing to this highly dynamic set of behavioral experiences. Uh, and we're, we're still trying to we're still trying to catch up with that. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up was um, I think we, there, we now have a much finer appreciation for questions of um, environmental um, sustainability. Um, everything that we do is based on technology. Everything is plugged in. We're using a lot of power. We're producing a lot of heat that has to be disposed of. That's cooling takes a lot of power. Um, that has an impact on, on all of us, on the world. Um, uh, a lot of this technology, increasingly um, the manufacture of it involves all sorts of highly exotic materials, um, which are expensive to acquire, to refine, and especially to dispose of uh, quite safely. So we take this uh, we take this very very seriously, uh, and particularly working with Stu's group, as we're designing sort of the next iterations of at least the hardware side of things, um, we're we're very actively uh, trying to minimize, you know, the footprint that we're we're placing on the environment and on, and on the earth. Um, and then lastly, one thing I'd like to bring about is um, over the last couple of years in the archival community, um, there has been an increasingly active discussion. Uh, uh, regarding issues of uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, because we are all faced with the reality of finite resources, any decision to archivally acquire this thing means we're not acquiring that thing. And similarly, a decision to preserve this means we're not preserving that. So it's very important for us to wrestle with how uh, we can ensure that our preservation activities um, always encompass the voices of the marginalized, the overlooked, and the unheard. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, I, I um, want to kind of echo a, a few themes uh, raised by um, by Stephen and and Abby uh, on the kind of environmental concerns. I just want to kind of kind of reiterate that that this is this is really on our minds as we think about the future of. Um, of digital preservation and big systems with big compute and big storage requirements that you know we don't want to compromise. As Abby, as as Abby said, we want to preserve rather than kind of think too much and overly curate, right? Because we don't know what's going to be used in the future and how. So we really want to err on the side of being more liberal um, and open-minded about what we what we preserve. Yet that's more data and that requires more compute and that requires more storage. So finding that balance is gonna be one of the big challenges of the future. And the second theme that I've, I've heard I'll, I'll, um, throughout the, the session has been this notion of preserving experiences and the temporal nature of kind of data. And that's really interesting. It's really interesting to me too. Two examples that I've been thinking about a lot and I think these are works in progress in the digital preservation community. One is um, Stephen used the word immersive, immersive technologies like 3D, but more so virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. Um, these technologies ha have been slower in my view to be fully embraced in the research and instructional practice. Um, but I do think that as they become uh, easier, produce, easier to produce these experiences, less costly to run, I do think they have the potential to be really disruptive in, in a positive way. Um, especially in the instructional in the instructional paradigm, and especially as we're kind of seeing, who knows what the lasting effects of our more kind of remote instruction environments will be. Um, so, so, so how do you how do you how do you kind of preserve and capture these these interactive experiences? Another example um, of something that's happening around us and that we're kind of looking at closely is the prevalence of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, and the ways uh, the influence of those technologies and the way we create um, and, descri and describe content. And the learning uh, models for characterizing content um, of all types and the content itself is constantly changing. The models are changing and thus the content is changing. Um, so this is to speak to the temporal nature um, of, of the data. How do you preserve a system that is constantly changing and learning over time? So it's, it's, really, it's really kind of interesting and you know, the, the, the question is about imposing. Um, and yeah, these are all things that are happening from within and from without, but it's really exciting to think about tackling some of these challenges in the future. Yeah, for so sure. So Martha, I, I, if I might add, um, 
you know, just riffing off what um, what Stu and Stephen have said, you know, I think partnerships can offer some solutions to these problems. So I'm thinking about, you know, Stephen was talking about, well, if we collect this, that means we can't collect that. But that's why you should partner with institutions for whom that really is core, um, so that it doesn't get lost. And it would um, it would be quite extraordinary if Harvard were known as the great collaborator um, in the next 20 years because they haven't had that reputation previously. Um, but I think that's a real opportunity for leadership. And as to the issue of ecological, you know, damage that computing does in general, um, the disregard we have for our machines and what it impact it has on water and air, um, which is essentially hidden from us all as citizens of the United States and elsewhere. Um, you know, I think that with some imagination, Harvard might be able to figure out partnerships with people in the engineering schools and in the business schools to talk about being a site for experimentation with you know, more clean and um, ecologically friendly ways of gathering, preserving and serving data. Why not make yourself some kind of a test site for that, a laboratory for that and not necessarily relying on the expertise just within the library, but the extraordinary faculty you have, um, which are dedicated to this and what looks like a good environment for the next four years for business opportunities to invest in this kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Abby. I love that phrase of, you know, Harvard will be the great collaborator. And I think, yes, you know, Stephen and Stuart nodding, because that's certainly our intent. I mean, we see partnerships as being core to this. And, you know, our work in, in collective collecting is just as much about the digital environment as it is about uh, those physical collections of the past and, and the present. But um, I, this has been a really interesting conversation. And I've been so struck by that. Um, I've been making lots of notes about, you know, thinking about things being bounded and fixed in time. And I really like Stephen's um, phrase of, you know, information is performed for us nowadays. And it, it really struck me that so often in our current landscape in, in uh, research, teaching and learning, we really are focused on the end product. You know, it's that idea of, of it's the article that's been produced or the book that's been produced. And, and that really is an old paradigm that we would love to shift. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, I often find thinking about the infrastructure that we have in place now that, that uh, or the systems of scholarly communication, we wouldn't design them that way. Um, you know, if we could start from scratch now with, with the sort of digital opportunities that we see, but what is it that we see in the future? Like we, we're sort of now grappling with that. We kind of know what the, the landscape looks like. What do you see as the future frontiers in, in this area? You know, what do you, what do you expect is going to happen next? That we need to be thinking about. You've all touched on that a bit, but I'll just ask you if you have other thoughts you'd like to share. Well, let me just say as an historian that one of the things that's most remarkable about this past 20 years is how little we knew about analog media. Um, it's really when we move into the digital that, and we spent what, a decade or more trying to make the digital look like analog. We thought about it in an analog way, all those PDFs that were like the default mode of preserving stuff. Um, you know, how is, it, how is it that the digital informs what the analog can do? What is the book or the article really good for? And I wouldn't say that it's, they're superseded now. On the contrary, I think they, their, their qualities are much more distinctive. So I think it's really about thinking about the continuity between what needs to be fixed um, for you know, scholarly credentials and all sorts of other reasons. Um, you, know, you certainly wouldn't uh, start the Encyclopedia Britannica today because you have Wikipedia, mm -hmm. uh, but there are lots of things which actually want to be fixed and they want to be fixed in a specific form because of the creativity and um, and the finality, the fixity of the human spirit and saying, this is me, this is this moment, this is what we were thinking about at this time, and this is how we want to communicate that. So I think it's really about, about sharpening our thinking about what analog does and what digital cannot do, because digital can't do everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Else want to comment? Uh, one of the things that, that I think it's, it's very incumbent on us to try to get across to, to our various stakeholder communities, um, again, it, it goes back to this notion of what, what we actually mean by, by digital preservation. Uh, but we need to get away from this notion that somehow that preservation is this end of life function. Mm -hmm. you know, there's this information <laughs> life cycle and things get created, they get used and then, oh, okay, now 
now we can now it's time to to preserve them somehow uh, and again this is going back to that that sort of um, analog thinking that that abby was was just warning us against um it there's there's decisions that are that get made um most often implicitly uh, at the very beginning, at the time of uh, acquisition or creation of digital information, that can have very, very serious, you know, downstream impacts. So it, it's really important that we have a very large tent and that we're bringing in everyone. That that preservation concerns are not just the concerns of folks like me; uh, they're the they're the concerns of everyone who is an information producer or an information consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, I think one thing that I'll, I'll add um, about the, the future um, it, in terms of a change of mindset is those of us who are kind of participating in this thinking, um, recognizing the fact that um, users want to make their own user experiences with our data. I think for a long time, um, digital preservation, you know, it, it's a it's complicated process. Um, we put it in um, and then we as the preservers kind of pull it out and create experiences for our users. And I think uh, as, as we've kind of learned over time, and I think moving into the future, uh, what we need to be able to do is enable our users to um, create their own user experiences, right? I think that, you know, us creating great user experiences are really important because I think that we're, uh, we're supporting our, our faculty and our students and we're representing the content that we collect um, in really important ways and really deliberate ways and also um, more and more, we want to, we want to empower and enable creativity with, our, with, with this preserved content. As Stephen talked about earlier, that's what this is about. And it's not just about making it downloadable. Um, it's not just about making it accessible on a website. It's really empowering our users to create their own user experience. And I think that, I think that that's a little bit of a shift of mindset in the way we build these systems. Um, it's supposed to store it and then create. It's really kind of preserve it and enable um, in new and creative ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to actually turn to some of the Q and A's now because we've had there's over a dozen that have come in and they follow up nicely um, on on the comments of the panelists. And so talking about that, just building on the idea of, of creation, uh, one question that came in is how do you think about digital humanities projects and creating durable virtual exhibitions? It is one thing to make sure digital records are archivally stable, but perhaps a greater challenge to design online projects that bring the objects to life to a broader community. Anyone want to take that? Uh, I'm not sure what, what is meant by bring something to life. So, I mean, I'm not going to ask the, um, the, the questioner, but I'm thinking that, you know, following up on what um, Stu said, in fact, um, you know, this is one of the, I mean, people do want to create their own user experience. They actually want to bring their own lives to something to make something come alive. And I think the question, um, the deeper question is, um, in some sense, Martha, this is another externality. How do we actually cultivate um, a mind in, in the users that, that enters easily into contemplative modes? Um, where creativity, where you actually spend time with what you're looking at, um, rather than having a, an experience delivered at an exhibition quickly um, and dynamically, how do you actually, in the user, cultivate that sense of taking time out? Um, and I'm just thinking about the music we started with, those kinds of experiences, which are um, time-based and seem to suspend time, that's what a successful analog exhibition does. It gets us to pause. And I think um, one of the things, and again, this is an externality, this has nothing to do with digital preservation or curation even, but an education um, challenge to us all is how do we recapture the um, inculcation of that um, learning how to attend to something over time? So I think that's a larger question, um, uh, which I think libraries can respond to, but they can't really direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll take a quick shot at the exhibit, the digital humanities question, because I thought about this in practical terms for a while. Um, and it's a, it's a great question. And I think at the highest level, what I'll say is, um, is that this is, this is why libraries are great places to support digital humanities. Um, because when we work with scholars who are doing these amazingly creative projects, it's important to have the preservation mindset 
baked in from the start. And that is that you want this work, this really creative and interactive, sometimes immersive work to, to um, persist over time. And it's not always easy. Um, it says, I think Abby, Abby said earlier about being a little bit disciplined about the formats that we, that we choose, um, the way in which projects are built. We don't wanna be overly prescriptive, but we do wanna be thinking about digital preservation um, from, from the beginning. Now, there are a variety of ways you can try to preserve a digital humanities project. If, if it's a, you, know, you could try to emulate it. If it's immersive, you wanna make sure that you have the, the different bits of data and maybe even the code that goes into it preserved. Um, maybe you want a simplified version of it so that it, you know, you're sure that it lasts forever. There are a handful of ways to think about how do I make a, a project like this persist? The important thing is to have that preservation mindset um, and, and the list of questions to ask about its long-term persistence in mind from the start. Mm -hmm. Stephen, is there anything you want to add to that or should I move on? Uh, I think we can move on. <laughs> okay. Um, and by the way, I know that we are almost out of time and they're just glancing through these questions. There's a lot of fabulous questions. We will uh, be making this recording available and we'll also um, provide answers to these from, you know, as best we can from our perspectives. But I wanted to touch on one that I know will um, really resonate with so many people. Um, at a time when it's easier than ever to digitally manipulate items, for example, photo, video, voice of the past and present to intentionally misrepresent what are the facts or the circumstance of something, how is Harvard digitally protecting and securing a truthful version of these cultural artifacts in a way that leaves them open to academic interpretation and historical explication, but doesn't put the core fact or artifact at risk? So I'm sure each of you could, could uh, provide <laughs> quite lengthy comments on that, but we just have a few minutes left, so but I'd love to hear what you have to say. So this is, this is a very interesting and very profound question because it gets to this very core distinction um, in, in the archival world between authenticity and reliability. Uh, authenticity is the quality of information being what it purports to be, whereas reliability um, is the quality of information being worthy, of, be, uh, worthy to be trusted. Uh, and of course, you could have all the four permutations of that. You could have unreliable, authentic stuff. You could have unauthentic, but reliable stuff and so forth. Uh, traditionally, we in memory institutions have um, taken on our responsibility to deal with authenticity. Uh, reliability has generally been left to um, the determination of, of the ultimate consumer. Um, on, and we, we do take authenticity extremely seriously. It's, it's one of our core imperatives. Um, it is somewhat um, distributed as, as so much else here at, at Harvard, at the Harvard Library is, um, because my colleagues and I in, in the Central Preservation Program, we do not have the curatorial expertise to uh, realistically make determinations of authenticity. Uh, we rely very, very heavily on the curators and collection managers out in the you know, 70 odd some uh, libraries in the, in the Harvard system. Um, once we receive it in our central infrastructure, we have a variety of technical processes in place uh, that are intended to ensure that critical authenticity. And I'm happy to say that over 20 years, and we have half a petabyte of stuff and over 110 million files, um, there's been damage occasionally over time. Um, the best as we can tell, it's never been, it's, it's been due to mechanical failure rather than uh, malice. Uh, but in all cases, we've been able to um, respond uh, appropriately and to restore the correct, authentic value of the information that's under our stewardship care. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'm just going to say one thing. I'm not going to add anything to what Stephen said, aside from the fact that Harvard is lucky to have Stephen Abrams leading its digital <laughs> preservation initiative into the future. Not only does he have kind of a comprehensive understanding of these kinds of issues, but he does a great job of explaining them. Definitely. Yeah, and I, I would like to say um, we live in a time when uh, lies are a very important part of public life. And if we don't preserve them as lies um, authentically um, without, you know, guaranteeing the truthfulness of it, um, then then we will have fallen down on the job because we will not be able to under people in the future won't be able to understand what we were undergoing during this period when lies were tossed about as if they were truthy. 
So I, um, I fully agree with Stephen's very important distinction between what is authentic and what is true. Definitely. Well, I have to say that the job of the moderator in this is somewhat challenging because I've been fascinated by the conversation and I've been scanning the questions and just thinking there are so many different topics that we would like to explore in this. But we did commit to uh, making sure that you could get on to your next events um, by three o'clock Eastern time. So I did want to wrap up and uh, just say thank you so much to our panelists, Abby, Stu, and Stephen. It was really wonderful to hear your thoughts on this incredibly important topic. And I really thank all of you who've been with us for celebrating 20 years. Um, there are many pictures of birthday cakes in the DRS that we've discovered as we were preparing for this. <laughs> So we will be, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing a link uh, to the recording of this event with you and we will follow up with the answers to the questions that we weren't able to get to during the event. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thank you all, all of you who have really uh, worked so hard over the years in this digital preservation environment and thank you in advance for all the work that we are going to do collaboratively together in this landscape going forward. So thank you everybody and stay safe. Bye-bye.